We're here today with um, Jonathan Sriranganathan, uh, who is a Greens Gabba Ward councillor, but soon to be finishing up a seven year term. Uh, so we're here to discuss uh, his conclusions and reflections on that experience. Before we get underway, I just obviously acknowledge that we are recording this on stolen Jagera Turbal land. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. And we, uh, I think, both pledge ourselves to ongoing campaigns for justice for Aboriginal people. Um, so let's just jump into it. I mean, um, you've kind of made a, you've made a few comments recently about you know reflecting on your time. Perhaps you want to just begin by outlining outlining what are your the key reflections or thoughts you've got about your experience in council. Yeah, thanks, Alex. So I think you know when I first got involved with the Greens, one of the reasons I did so was because I saw that the party in Queensland was a little bit weak, to be honest, and didn't have the electoral clout it needed to provide a sort of useful support for grassroots struggles and movement building. And I think that was particularly evident during the Campbell Newman years where you had sort of centre-right Labour Party was the only real strong opposition and, you know, a bit of unionism and stuff. But like there was no strong left wing electoral movement against Newman, really. And so a lot of what the Labour movement at that time was doing really felt like centrist compromise. And so for me, I partly got involved with the Greens because I was like, geez, we need to be winning some seats in Queensland. And that's something that I think I've definitely helped with. Like we cracked through in the Gabba Ward in 2016 and now we have two state seats and um, five federal seats and probably more state and council seats on the way in next year's local and state elections. So I feel pretty proud of that. And I think that's an important like, yeah, achievement that I've helped contribute to. I certainly wouldn't claim sole credit. Um, Beyond that, I think at the local government level, we've been able to encourage people to see the relevance of local politics and to broaden a lot of people's awareness about why they should pay attention to council and why local government matters. Um, and certainly for my theory of change as someone who thinks that, you know, big social change comes from the bottom up, recognizing that local government fits into that ecosystem of um, different structures and institutions we need to be paying attention to has felt really powerful. I, I, like there's lots of tangible stuff we've been able to do on the ground, but one of the important aspects I think I've brought to the role is a real attentiveness to public space. And a lot of the changes we've advocated for in terms of how public spaces are designed and managed have really been about cracking open, you know, more usability for marginalized groups and also insisting on that right to public assembly, which we can probably talk about later a bit more. But yeah, I guess, the other thing that maybe people haven't, don't always see as much uh, in kind of the media narratives is that our office has taken a very deliberate approach of trying not to be buck passing bureaucrats. And so how we serve constituents and how we interact with people coming into the office seeking our support is more of a community development sort of skills based empowerment approach to serving constituents. It's not just like, oh, they come in one in help and we say, well, here's how we can help with, with you or no, too bad, off you go. It's more like, how can we work together to collectively solve these problems? And that's been something that I think my office staff take a lot of credit for. And we all are continually sort of strategizing, how can we ensure that underneath it all, what we're doing is not reinforcing dependence upon the nation state or government systems, but how are we actually supporting community groups and projects to connect with each other and build up autonomous local community capacity so people can sort of solve their own problems or have more control over their own lives rather than just doing a good job of serving them as a council ward office and i i think on, on that yeah measure as well i think we've done a good job of connecting up groups building up community capacity finding you know different people with passions and linking them together so that more stuff happens on the ground and i think when i look back over the past seven years of what's happened in Brisbane's in the south side, not only have the Greens done really well, but a lot of different uh, like s struggles and community movements and anti-capitalist community projects have also been flourishing. And I think we've played our part in the ecosystem of that sort of broader consciousness raising and solidarity and connection building and making sure that, yeah, all, all of these other things are still ticking along and hopefully growing as well. So I guess I wanted to ask you specifically about the role of elected representatives and social change. And I guess mm. there's sort of two, th I mean, 
like almost on the negative and the positive. Like on the, on the negative side, in the left and the progressive movement has been this. You know, as long as there's been parliaments, it's been the the battle to keep progressive representatives accountable. Mm. That's like almost on the negative. But the positive side is, well, how can we actually use these positions to actually advance yeah. grassroots struggles? So maybe if we could talk about both of those, you want to start off yeah. first with the accountability. You know, what, what are your thoughts about keeping elected representatives accountable? Yeah, I, I think this is something that sort of the left is still failing to strategize deeply around, particularly in sort of Brisbane and Australia more generally, because, and I think we see this particularly with how the federal Greens have been using balance of power lately, but also just more generally like um, our, our Greens MPs are not very accountable to the broader, call it the left. Um, the, and there's not really any strong, robust processes to hold our elected reps accountable. It really, the way that accountability seems to operate is that every few years people decide whether they feel motivated to volunteer in campaign on elections. And maybe that's one way that the left, say down in Victoria, has held the Victorian Greens accountable in a way, is that people, a lot of younger activists have stopped campaigning for the Victorian Greens and instead campaigning for the Victorian Socialists. And that's one of the only accountability mechanisms is like, fine, we won't help you get re-elected. Um, but beyond that, like, uh, the, the Greens have a still a growing party membership, but not particularly strong. So do you have thoughts about how to improve that like yeah, ability. well, I think like per perhaps part of it is that, you know, the Greens do have democratic structures where we've got all these branches and anyone can join their local branch and have a direct say in party policy and the MPs or elected reps come along to each branch meeting and take questions from the branch. So like, you know, last night I was at, I was at the South Brisbane branch meeting and we were asking Max questions about the safeguards mechanism and what he's going to do with the housing bill and that feels like a really good accountability mechanism for the like 20 or so branch members who come along to branch meetings. But it's kind of wild that like tens of thousands of people vote for these Greens politicians, thousands of people volunteer to help them get elected. And then between elections, yeah, maybe 20 people turn up to a branch meeting to sort of keep tabs on what they're actually doing with their role. So I think one element is definitely using those party structures and being like, all right, well, we do have these branch structures and a Green State Council there's nothing stopping more activists joining up as the party and then they have a vote in pre-selections. They have a vote or a say in party policy debates. They can directly um, ask questions of elected representatives and sort of hold them accountable through those party structures. But then I think alongside that, we also need to be demanding that our elected representatives initiate their own participatory democracy processes for various um, decisions and exercises of power. So I do a lot of that at the local level in terms of organizing a community vote about whether the bus stop should be relocated or organizing a participatory budgeting process about how we allocate our local park upgrades budget. So that's sort of inspired a lot by the experience from a lot of South American cities in particular. Um, and so I do that, that it's kind of led by the elected rep, but there's nothing forcing other elected reps to do that sort of thing. Um, and I, I guess it, it also comes back to the fact that once people in our current system get elected, there's not, they're not recallable delegates. You can't sort of withdraw their power at the drop of a hat. It's basically like every three or four years there's a pre-selection and elected reps almost always just run again and everyone just pre-selects them again. Um, so I, I think the other accountability mechanism could actually just be term limits. And I've been pushing that a little bit within the Greens. And I think a lot of radical or progressive political movements recognize that if you've got some full-time paid people who are essentially paid to be politicians, no amount of like extra media or processes or plebiscites or whatever is ever truly going to be able to hold that power accountable because they're paid full-time and everyone else is sort of volunteering trying to keep up with what they're doing. So having strict rules that say you can't serve for more than one or two terms and then it's time to step down and let someone else have a go stops that power accruing. And so for me, one of the ways to hold myself accountable is to step down because I could comfortably hold this seat for another two, three, four terms. People would keep pre-selecting me. I'd just keep getting voted in um, and accruing more soft power as a result. So term limits, I think, are a really important one to think about more as well. I think in the, um, in the socialist left, I think two of the key things that we've advocated for are, on the one hand, accountability. So they're like, political representatives can be recalled yeah. um, either by the community that elected them or else by the, the party that they're, mm. they're seeking to represent. 
and on the other hand, um, uh, you know, living on a worker's wage. So basically, there's yeah. not that material incentive to, um, uh, I guess, to, to see yourself associating with the um, with capital. With, yeah. 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 What are your thoughts about those? those yeah, kinds I, of I think those are really good ideas. I mean, the former, it's like that would require changing the electoral system to have recallable delegates that can be recalled by the community at large. Um, I think the Greens could theorize and think deeply about how can we have recall mechanisms. But the problem is that the, the electoral penalty of like pulling someone out halfway through a term or whatever is so strong. Uh, and I, you know, I think we kind of saw this a little bit with the, the Democrats. It was a little bit be before my time, but that constant change in leaders, etc. It does sort of destabilize a party electorally and make it harder for them to win seats. And I can imagine that even if the Greens introduced a function where they, they had the power to force someone to step down from their role, they'd want to use it very, very sparingly. And we saw that with Jeremy Buckingham in New South Wales, where there were pr some pretty strong allegations around sexual assault. A lot of people in the party really wanted him to step down, but people were equally concerned about, well, how can we guarantee that we'll hold this seat? Um, but I think the, that uh, other conversation about like uh, keeping people accountable through sort of capped wages or um, even simple rules, like at the moment, the Greens in Queensland are debating, and it's sort of a branch by branch debate as to whether landlords should be excluded from pre-selection eligibility and saying you can't be a candidate if you own investment properties. Those sorts of party rules, I think, could go a long way. Um, currently, all Greens politicians are required to tithe 10% of their salary. Um, that could be a lot higher, you know. Um, I, I tithe 10% of my salary to the party, and then on top of that, I donate a lot more to other community projects. So that means that over my seven years, I haven't accrued as much wealth. I still don't own any real estate. I still have, I guess, a class interest in challenging the treatment of housing as a commodity. Whereas if I'd been taking a full salary and had been able to, and had bought a place of my own, then I would have a personal financial interest in property values continuing to rise. Um, so I think that, is, that does help. Uh, but I, yeah, I still think there's, it's, it's almost naive of us to think that we can have certain extra processes and rules to fully restrain the power of elected reps, they're, the way the system is structured, they're always going to have more hierarchical power. So we have to be willing to replace them on a regular basis. Mm. Well, well, let's talk about that positive side. How can elected rep representatives actively build and promote the, um, the grassroots community struggles? Yeah. What are your thoughts about that? I think one thing that I've tried to do, and I hope I've demonstrated better than a lot of politicians, is to stay embedded in activist community. And that that doesn't necessarily... I think there's a risk that that could be reduced down to, oh, he gets along to rallies and he occasionally supports struggle with donations or loaning equipment or whatever. Um, and we've done a lot of that. Like, uh, I think a lot of the big rallies in Brisbane have used PA systems borrowed by, from my office and we do a lot of free printing and all that sort of um, tangible logistical support. But I think beyond that, it's about uh, being embedded in those social networks and like hanging out with people so that they're, uh, they're the social community that I'm accountable to. Uh, and I think being willing to lead, lead from the front a little bit. And there's always a tension there where elected reps, they don't want to be co-opting a particular movement or like just putting themselves at the microphone. And, um, and I try to avoid that as well. And I, I certainly go to a lot more rallies than I am invited to speak at, for example. Um, but I think beyond that, it's, it's about being genuinely embedded in communities of struggle. And uh, I think, yeah, that's important. I think there's, there's almost a, a, a slight, there's a risk of two things getting conflated. And one is that you can have this idealized version of an elected representative who supports rallies and gets involved in activism and uses their position within, elect, in, within the establishment to like highlight abuses of power and critique the system. And I think a lot of people see me as doing that and that I'm doing that quite well. Um, but I think that's still slightly different from an elected representative who is using their position to actively delegitimize the very existence of the nation state. Mm. And we can point to quite a few Greens MPs who do a lot of the former, where they're supporting rallies and getting involved in grassroots struggle. Um, but by virtue of holding elected office, your very presence within the system risks legitimizing it. So you have to work extra hard to delegitimize it. And I think that some, some even say something like the Guardian article or some of the progressive commentary around me has been like, 
He's been doing a good job of being an elected representative while also getting to, along to rallies, but it's more than that. It's about how can we build up alternative systems to render the hierarchical nation state irrelevant. And, and that's really what I'm interested in. And that's what I worry that I haven't been able to do enough of. I worry that people are like, oh, look, John is elected. I guess I still have some faith in electoral politics. And I'm like, no, no, no. The, we, we see electoral politics and engaging with electoralism as a tool in the toolkit and an important part of a broader strategy for social change. But the end goal definitely is not to get more Greens elected within the existing system. The, that's a means to a broader end of we want to tear down these oppressive systems and rebuild something that's more egalitarian and decentralized. So, well, yeah. Well, let's talk about that question, which I guess I would label in a broad label, anti-capitalism. Mm. Um, uh, I think a lot of people have, I think anti, the idea of anti-capitalism is a lot more acceptable and popular these days. Or mm. I think a lot of people have a very shallow conception of what it means. Like if you shop at the local farmer's market, you're not giving money to Woolworths and that's yeah, anti-capitalism. Yeah. And I guess where I would see it, it's a much more profound transformation of power structures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, can we talk about that and like, yeah, how would you, how to use elected positions to further that goal? Yeah, because there, there would certainly be some, quite a lot of people, I think, within the Queensland Greens who would say that the, the Greens policy platform has become increasingly anti-capitalist. So we're essentially talking about like massive taxation on the big end of town and the mega wealthy and putting that into free university education, free dental care, more public housing, et cetera, et cetera. And I guess on one definition of anti-capitalism, you know, that fits that definition. It's, I guess, a social democratic vision of the nation state, tax and spend, provide public services. To me, that still doesn't attack the root of capitalism. It's still because I think, um, you know, capitalist markets are actually created by the nation state, etc. So, like, I think a deeper understanding of anti-capitalism is like, no, no, we, if we really want to deal with all the evils of capitalism, we have to recognize that the nation state is complicit in that. Um, so I, I guess really we're kind of, it's an ambiguous term and it means different things to different people. So some people would say, oh, well, we're doing enough just by advocating for taxing the billionaires and making everything else free for like, and that's cool. And I think that gets us some of the way there. And I think if we're calling for say universal free public transport and that you know means more people can move around more freely and if we're calling for, free public housing and that means more people aren't under housing stress that does open up potential for other sites of resistance and deeper social transformations but I also think there's a risk that again we kind of stop there and we think oh the goal is just to get more Greens elected so that we can bring in a proper social democratic platform whereas maybe the really the goal is okay how can we you know aim for these non-reformist reforms that open up more space for deeper radical change that, that does mean like building up communes and communal capacity and workers collectives and all that sort of stuff so that yeah the the system of government as we know at the moment uh, as we know it at the moment ceases to exist or, or becomes less relevant does that kind of answer the question a, well the yeah. thing is it's very look we yeah. take it in many different directions there's um yeah uh i mean obviously yeah it gives some answer to it i mean i guess it still doesn't i guess the question is well, the, the, the thing is, there are no black and white answers. Yeah, sure. Like, there's, yeah. there's, it's a process we all need to go through and help learn together mm. um, how to achieve it. But I, I guess there's, it is that question of challenging the power structure. I mean, to me, I feel like that's very connected with a. Uh, we'll put this. Uh, I was in Bob Brown's office one time, yeah. and I put to him the idea that the Australian Parliament is not very democratic, mm. and he was surprised by me making that suggestion. Yeah. Um, whereas to me, it feels very obvious that the parliamentary system is structured in a way to marginalize most people from mm. meaningful decision-making power so we yeah. all get a vote that's great i yeah. much prefer to have a vote than be in a dictatorship but at the same time i think if you ask most ordinary people how much say do you really have about what goes on in this country the honest answer for most people is not very much, much. Yeah. yeah yeah so the question is like well, i guess what's your vision for how we can change that i think to start with to like to diagnose part of what i think is wrong with representative democracy like i don't think it is very de democratic at all um even if you have really good reps and even if they're you've got caps on corporate donations so they're not taking money from the corporate sector and even if you have a really highly engaged electorate and everyone's paying attention at election time and the media's reporting honestly on what's going on even if all those conditions are are right um you still have this problem where every, you vote every three or four years a small number of people get appointed into positions of power 
then that small group of people appoints an even smaller number of people as portfolio holders for particular ministries or in the case of council, particular chair in particular committees. And so you have these multiple layers of hierarchy where a relatively small number of people end up with a huge amount of decision-making power. Um, and even if they have got the best of intentions, they do not have the time to make all those decisions themselves. So what they tend to do is take advice from the people that are closest to them. And that's one way that corruption infiltrates the system because maybe lobbyists have more access to them because they just have more time to lobby them. Or they take advice um, from the public service and they're essentially, um, they're, they're delegating decision-making to the public service, but the public service kind of instinctively knows that it has no democratic legitimacy. And so it then parcels up decision-making through bureaucracy and a decision is like, compartmentalized and bureaucratized to the point where no one is really making the decision. And so then the public service is kind of, these decisions go round and round in circles. No one's really taking responsibility. It actually ends up kind of embedding the status quo and being really resistant to any kind of big change. And then the public service makes the decision and then the minister rubber stamps it. And that's really the problem we have at the moment is that even if you have good people elected into that system, they become decision-making bottlenecks. They don't have time to make the decisions themselves. They delegate the decisions to people who are not democratically accountable. So we might vote for the politicians, but we're not voting for the head of the department or whoever's actually exercising power. Um, or the other thing they'll do is outsource decision making to private consultancies. Um, so that's the problem, right? And I think the solution to that is partly a reinvigoration of direct participatory democracy. So rather than the politicians outsourcing decision making or delegating to the public service, we should decentralize it back to the people. So I could, for example, ask the transport planners, okay, you guys look at your modeling and you tell me where the bus stop should go. Um, and we essentially like delegate to these experts. But I think people are experts in their own lives and that rather than a handful of public servants making that decision, let's let the 20,000 people who use that bus route have a vote and decide where they want the stops to be. And that that will actually lead to better outcomes. It'll lead to a more engaged citizenry um, and it's kind of easy to imagine people making that democratic decision about where they want the bus stops to be. But that, that philosophy can be scaled up to much bigger decisions. And we, so we could have, for example, participatory decision-making processes about how the federal budget is allocated. And if you said to people, how many of your tax dollars do you want spent on healthcare and public housing? And how many do you want spent on nuclear submarines? We know we'd get very different outcomes, even if right now the public service is saying to the politicians, spend all your money on the military industrial complex. So. I think a reinvigoration of direct participatory democracy, even if we have elected reps, their, their role is re, uh, reimagined as being how do we facilitate the community to make decisions rather than the community electing us to make decisions for it. Um, and if we can gradually build up community capacity and engagement so that people are making more and more of those decisions themselves, we can gradually re render these hierarchical systems irrelevant. And so the public service and the elected reps, uh, they exist to enact the will of the people rather than to decide what happens and, and enact that. Um, yeah, that's kind of, my, uh, in a nutshell, the broad vision I have for how we might start to restructure our democracy. But I think we also need to resist that temptation to want to plan it out in detail and micromanage and articulate from my, on, how I, on high, this is how I think it should go. It should be an iterative process and organic and decentralized that allows many different strategies and responses to emerge. And there's this sort of creative tension and cross-pollination where we all collectively create a different form of collective decision-making. Mm. Yeah, that all sounds wonderful. Okay, the thing that you haven't mentioned, which I guess to me feels like is also part of this whole discussion is you can conceive of the most perfect structure mm. and you know plan but while we have a situation where the economy is dominated by a handful of multi-billionaires that have yeah. just got so much power by virtue of that, even the, you said at the beginning, even if the media reported honestly, well, the thing is the media is owned by those big, yeah. you know, like every you know, every section of the economy. And then when you've got fossil fuel executives or companies mm. making literally tens of billions of dollars of profit every year, um, you know, like that, that that's no, no structure can, can, compete with that mm. so yeah i guess that's the other to me that's the other side of the story what are your, yeah and what that's your why thoughts? civil disobedience becomes necessary and why i've been so involved in protests because even if you have really progressive governments they're still prone to the threat of capital strikes where and i think we've seen the labor party at times be disciplined by this where they've contemplated 
stronger regulations on the property development industry or on the mining industry. And those investors have said, well, if you bring in those rules, we're going to withdraw our money and we're going to take it to America or to, US, to Asia or whatever. And we're going to make your entire population broke because we're pulling all our money. And that is kind of a legitimate threat that capital can sort of wield. Um, and so we need to be theorizing how we challenge that. And for me particularly, like I'm looking towards a future where maybe the Greens do win control of Brisbane City Council and maybe we do have balance of power in the state and federal governments. But even if we have like the electoral power to implement more of our platform, we've still got this risk of risk that um, the corporate sector just pulls out its money or, you know, IMF or whoever gets involved and comes in over the top. Um, and that's why I think pr protest, and I mean civil disobedience, I don't just mean sort of non-disruptive peaceful protests where we march around the block and we gather in the place that the police told us to gather. Like it has to be disruptive. It has to be strategically oriented to make it harder for capital to continue profiteering off us. So directly disrupting those key choke points in the machinery of capital, and that might be ports or it might be coal train lines or it might be like financial trading hubs and banks, etc. We have to be willing to engage in those forms of protest because right now capital has such a lock on the current system and simply expecting that we can just vote in better people every few years. They're not going to have enough power to challenge that either. I guess I've always looked at civil disobedience as still a means to an end rather than an end in itself. And I mm. think um, some people almost see civil disobedience as, as the end. Mm. Uh, do you have any comments about it? Oh, oh, yeah. What do you see the limits to civil disobedience? Yeah, I think there's a genuine, gen uh, there's a legitimate critique to be made of kind of some of the performative activism where it's almost like causing disruption for the sake of disruption and you get the media headline and then there's nothing beyond that. Uh, but I think most people who engage in civil disobedience see it as one, one tool in the toolkit, like electoralism, and we have all these different ways of applying pressure on the system. And often it, you know, it's the same people who are engaging in civil disobedience who are also volunteering to grow food in the local community garden. Like, they're, they're doing both of those things at once. And in fact, like, you know, one of the projects we've supported a lot around here has been helping urban farmers get established without council approval because the council didn't want the new community garden to be set up in the park. So people just went and did it. And that too is a form of civil disobedience. So civil disobedience doesn't just mean protest and disruption. It also means creating alternative systems and projects that are kind of hostile to the interests of the nation state or antagonistic towards the nation state but also build up alternative community capacity. So I take a very broad view of what we mean by civil disobedience. I would also include in that category stuff like housing occupations and squatting, where you know to squat and violate those private property rights, that's definitely a form of civil disobedience, but you're also creating housing. And so I think civil, civil disobedience can be generative and creative as well, not purely destructive or disruptive. Uh, and I think um, for me, there's a, a lot of potential in normalizing the idea of resisting and you know like a lot of the problem with society is at the moment is just most people follow dumb rules even when they know that they're stupid rules so a lot of people in their day-to-day -day life are like i shouldn't have to do this or i don't know why i'm doing this but i'm just going to do it because the rules tell me to whereas if we can develop a culture of people thinking for themselves and resisting and refusing to comply with stupid policies that too helps change systems at a, at a massive level and civil disobedience plays a role in cracking open that idea and being like, oh, rules don't have to be followed. And, and if protesters can show that in the street, maybe then people can also take that back to their workplaces and other spheres of influence. Um, if it's okay, let's talk for a little bit about police. Yeah, sure. Um, that's, I know it's something that you've uh, made commentary about a number mm. of times. I mean, can you, I guess, yeah, give us your thoughts about on the one hand, what role do police play in society? On the other hand, uh, how much respects do police deserve from elected representatives? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the first piece of that answer is that it's interesting because I don't actually think I talk about police that much, but because it is so unusual for an elected representative to express any kind of criticism of the police, even when I make a fairly mild criticism or something that could be, you know, uncharitably interpreted as a criticism, I'm still subject to a lot of scrutiny and there's a lot of commentary and outrage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, like, I do think that police are agents of capital and that one of the primary roles they serve in society is to control and suppress collective dissent. 
and to protect the, the stolen and hoarded wealth of the mega wealthy. I think when you really drill down into it, that's what police do. They, on the side, they might sort of um, investigate crimes against the person and they do sometimes play a role in like, you know, preventing violence offences and, you know, ordinary people who are getting their stuff stolen. But really they exist to protect the property interests of the mega wealthy. And we see that in terms of how police deploy their resources. They actually deploy comparatively a small amount of resources towards, say, keeping our roads safe from like reckless construction vehicles driving through residential streets. They don't actually put, even though like road safety is a really big safety issue for a lot of people in cities, they don't actually put that much time into that sort of enforcement. But if, you know, a couple of people were to try to squat Clive Palmer's third empty mansion, you can bet that the police would there, be there in big numbers. That's where they would prioritize their resources. Um, so I think, you know, that's primarily the function police play in society and a lot of their other functions that they do play are ancillary to, to that or are kind of almost public relations. You know, they do try to do other good things here and there on the margins, but it's all in service of building a case for them to have more resources and more power and control over society as a whole. The, but I actually haven't really talked much about that in public. I think I'm quite restrained not really um, because anyone else doesn't want me to, but just because I haven't had the time to articulate a really robust and thoughtful critique of the role of police in society. And I think occasionally I'll share articles, but I think it's, yeah, when you ask, is it the role of elected representatives to critique this, these systems? I think it definitely is, and that we should all be doing more of that. And even I should probably be doing more of it. And I think the reason I don't sometimes is because whenever I voice even a, a minor criticism of the police, the level of hate and abuse is so, you know, so intense that it does subtly dissuade you from speaking out the next time. And each time I do speak out about like police killing an Aboriginal man or corruption in the police force or whatever, uh, I do pay a per wear a personal cost for that. And so I think like it's important for more elected representatives to get in the habit of flexing that muscle where it becomes regular and consistent for elected representatives to critique police abuses of power or misuses of power uh, so that we can build a healthier culture of holding police to account and create the discursive space in society where more people can have these critically reflective conversations about what the role of the police is. Um, because right, where, well, right now we're a long way away from that and it's hard for most people to even conceptualise a conversation about police abolition and to start having those discussions. So really the role of, I think, Green's elected like reps should be to broaden the parameters of debate and at least pose these questions and say, okay, well, are police actually making us safe? Are, um, are we, you know, seeing a re reduction in the kinds of crimes that we want police to be dealing with? You know, are, do we feel like there are a fewer domestic violence assaults? Do we feel like, you know, a, a lot of the stuff that people say the police do they're not actually doing a very good job of dealing with. So, um, yeah, I think we need to be posing those questions. I wanted to ask you about, I guess, the role of the, of the Greens and discussion in the Greens in this sort of broader social change project. Mm. I think a lot of things that you've said today are probably not, wouldn't be articulated in the same way by other Greens representatives. Mm. So I guess, do you have any comments about uh, how things might unfold in terms of discussions and debates and, mm. um, uh, I mean, all all progressive, the whole history of the progressive movement, you know, with uh, parliamentary representation has been this contest between moderate versus radical and, mm. and how far to push things. Can you talk about that and discuss that? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing I'd say is that, like, we have been, compared to what the baseline was for elected Greens reps, we've been very radical in this office and it has paid off. We've won more votes, we've won more seats. So there's this sort of orthodoxy, even within the Australian Greens of, like, oh, if we're too radical, we'll put people off. There's no evidence of that. There is no strong evidence that articulating really radical messages or using less orthodox tactics to get your message across, there's no evidence that that has backfired or come at an electoral cost. And in fact, when you look at the Greens reps who are more moderate or um, you know less likely to actively organise a protest as opposed to just getting along to one that someone else has organised, uh, their votes haven't been growing in the same way. So I guess the first point I'd make is that this sort of accepted folk wisdom in a lot of progressive circles that we can't be too radical or we'll put off the voters doesn't actually seem to hold up under cr close scrutiny. But that is still a really dominant narrative within a lot of sectors of the Greens. And I think 
it's the elected reps themselves are not well positioned to critique that narrative because as an elected representative, you have so little time for self-reflection in general. The, you're torn between a thousand different things. You're, you never stop, like barely have time to read a book, right? And so those people who are in those positions of power are not going to have the headspace to critically reflect on how they're being co-opted or how they could be doing things differently. So I think it, it really falls back to Greens members and this sort of wider progressive base to be articulating and theorizing this stuff rather than saying, well, we've got some good Greens people elected. I guess they'll be thinking about this stuff now. Um, I do worry that as the Greens win more seats, we'll be increasingly co-opted by the nation state. I think we see examples of that already in other states, but uh, even like in terms of how the Queensland Greens sometimes orient in moments of like crisis or tension. So an interesting example, say, was the COVID lockdowns and the Labor state government was proposing some pretty draconian like crackdowns on civil liberties. And at least initially our Queensland Greens MPs, they were almost forced into a binary of either like supporting these authoritarian measures and attacks on human rights or being seen as anti-vaxxers and COVID conspiracy theorists. Um, and there wasn't much time or political space for them to chart a third way of being like, yes, we do need public health measures. We, we do need to take COVID seriously, but actually police locking up anyone who has a protest in the street is not great. There wasn't necessarily much space for those elected reps to make that decision um, or to sort of push. And I, and I, I found that an interesting example of how even really good people with good intentions can be co-opted by these pressures of time and, and hierarchy. Um, so I, yeah, I'm quite worried that we might see more of that. Um, like another interesting example just recently was that my office and Max Chandler Mather's office, we were talking about planning an, a community event where we talked about how the community could resist evictions. So we were going to present some of the case studies that my office has been involved in ev eviction resistance and blockading people, blockading evictions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we were about to organize that event, but then the Liberal Party declared that they weren't going to support Labor's housing fund, which meant that the Greens were confirmed as having balance of power. And so suddenly Max's office was like, oh, we're in balance of power. We've got to talk about this now. And so that event that was going to be about how do we resist evictions and how do we support community campaigns to push back on landlord exploitation of tenants turned into a forum of like, how should the Greens vote in Parliament on the housing bill? And so Max's office simply didn't have the time and resources to organise both things. It wasn't that they didn't care anymore about the community campaigning and the civil disobedience stuff. It was just like they had to sort of make a choice of like, well, we can't talk about everything. We've got a weekend. We've got one meeting. Let's let's make that meeting about how we vote on the housing bill. Um, but in that context, people are still looking to Max's office and my office, et cetera, for leadership. And when you don't have a Greens elected reps, there are a lot of activists out there who might say, oh, well, we've, we've got these terrible Labor or Liberal MPs. We've got to organize a protest or we've got to do something ourselves as a community. Once you have Greens elected, I think, unfortunately, some activists are like, well, we'll take our lead from the Greens reps. They don't seem to be organizing a protest or they seem to have things under control. I guess it's fine. And that's one of my big concerns is that as we win more Greens representatives or green seats, that there's sort of a de-escalatory impact on grassroots struggle and mass mobilization. And I think maybe we see a little bit of that in terms of the Brisbane climate movement at the moment, where we've had this great election result where most of inner Brisbane, actually most of Brisbane now has a federal Greens elected representative. Huge outcome. Um, but a lot of people are like, well, it's like we've got some Greens elected, so maybe I don't need to go to another protest or maybe there's less of a sense of urgency for grassroots struggle. And that's, yeah, something that I'm a little bit concerned about. And to be honest, I don't know what the easy answer is to that. So it's something we need to all be thinking about a bit more. I guess from my point of view, coming from the socialist tradition, I guess we sort of see very much the idea that elected representatives should be playing an active role, not in taking over or dominating grassroots movements, but actively supporting, organising, initiating them. And mm. I guess, um, I mean, you mentioned climate, and I did want to ask, I know it's outside of kind of your direct area, but I mean, I was one of the people who was disappointed the Greens voted for the safeguard mechanism, even though it was improved by mm. the negotiations. Um, and I guess even, in some ways, even the vote wasn't 
one way or the other, the vote isn't so much as, in, as an issue as, and I know, and the Greens have said that, you know, the ACF and other, ACF and other climate um, organisations didn't organise movements independently. Mm. I guess I also feel like the Greens didn't organise anything. And yeah. to me, it was calling out, though, during the time of those negoti negotiations, it was calling out for a national lab action against all new coal and gas. And I, I, I don't know, do you not, I mean, I, to me, I would have thought, yeah, not for the Greens to sort of dominate it or control it, but I mean, to actively support it and initiate it if necessary. I mean, what, do you have any thoughts yeah, about that? I, I think the Greens were wrong to um, support what they did in terms of, like, they got some concessions, but I also think they really oversold the concessions. You know, like, the, the publicity that came out afterwards from Greens MPs and the party as a whole was like, great, we've, we've secured this, we're stopping a lot of coal and gas projects. That statement in and of itself is de-escalatory because a whole bunch of climate activists and progressive people on the ground will see that announcement and be like, oh, cool, something good has happened. Um, and then later the messaging got a bit more nuanced and they're like, no, no, we still need more changes. We need to ban new coal and gas and stuff. But I think the party really did the broader movement a bit of a disservice by acting like they'd secured a bit big win when actually they'd only secured some minor compromises and um, not much has really changed at, at that level. Uh, so I think the, you're right to s sort of suggest that the Greens need to be taking more of a leadership role in struggle on the streets. And I actually think it's kind of lazy for Greens politicians or staffers to say, well, we need other people out on the street organising this stuff because actually all those people have, have kind of put a lot of their time and energy into getting these Greens, elected, Greens reps elected. And people made a conscious choice, particularly in sort of 20, early 2022, to be like, OK, we don't have time to organise our rallies and go door knocking for the Greens. But for the time being, we're going to go door knocking for the Greens to help them get elected. For then Greens reps to turn around and say, oh, well, there wasn't enough momentum on the streets to back us to make this decision. It's like, no, no, the momentum from the streets is manifested in your election. We shouldn't need to have the rally because we got you elected. And if you're saying, well, we still need the rally, then you better put some resources towards organizing it. I think that is actually the, uh, like, I, I feel a bit disappointed that the Greens didn't go stronger in the negotiations, but I also feel a bit disappointed that the Greens were like, oh, all these other climate groups didn't have our back. Because to be blunt, of course, ACF and the Wilderness Society and whatever, these other big Enviro NGOs are very co-opted and captured, and we shouldn't be expecting them to lead on policy or advocacy. They're, to my mind, almost a block to deeper radical change. Um, and I know there's a lot of good stuff happening in those spaces and a lot of good people who work for those organizations. So I don't want to be too critical of them, but I don't think that's where the revolution's coming from. And I don't, um, I, I often see those organizations playing a de-escalatory role. So for Greens MBs to sort of be like, oh, well, those organizations didn't have our back or they weren't pushing strongly enough. Of course they weren't going to push strongly enough, but there's a big difference between those organizations and the mass movement on the streets. And really, the Greens need to be more tapped into what's going on on the street. And if there is a lull in activism or if there's not enough energy and Greens MPs feel like they need that cover and that they need mass mobilizations on the ground in order to have a stronger negotiating position with Labor, um, then they do need to be putting more resources and support into organizing it because the two kind of exist in symbiosis. Uh, and I, I guess I'd also go further to say that I, I think it was very undemocratic for the Greens party room to make that decision without involving the broader membership. And I think there's been an interesting contrast there between say how Max Chandler-Mather, who's the housing portfolio holder, he's running two surveys. He's run a big survey of Greens members and then a parallel public survey about what the Greens position should be and whether we should support the Labor bill. And then he's also out organizing door knocks and some public meetings about what Labor's put on the table. So he's at least trying to create spaces for broader constituency to tell the party hierarchy what they want. Whereas with the safeguards mechanism negotiations, there was none of that. Even I, as an elected Greens representative, no one from the party surveyed me formally and said, Jono, do you want us to vote yes or no? Here's what's on the table. I didn't get a say. And if even I'm not getting a say, actually, it's literally just the federal MPs in party room who are ultimately making this decision about what to accept in the negotiations. Uh, I think a, a better position would have actually been to turn around and say, we want to have these negotiations in public. Labor, if you want our votes, 
we don't want secret meetings behind closed doors where a couple of us are negotiating with a couple of you. Let's have it out in the open and have a big public forum and you can present your case and we'll present ours and insist on transparency at least so that more people can be brought into that conversation. But without that transparency and openness, by the time the Greens and Labor MPs are saying, okay, we've negotiated compromise, here's what the Greens are going to support, most of us have been kept so out of the loop that we're playing catch up even to work out whether that is a good deal. We haven't been included in the negotiation, so we don't really know what's on the table. We don't know what more we could have gotten. Um, so the very process of this mass movement, organizing to get a few Greens elected reps elected, and then a few of those reps go into a negotiating room with a few Labor reps, that whole thing's very disempowering and demobilizing. And so it's the process itself that we need to be critiquing uh, in addition to the outcome. I know we're running out of time. I mean, another sort of federal issue, I was going to ask if you had wanted to make any brief comments mm. about The Voice. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess I'd say I, I think it's kind of a similar thing where the, you know, the party quite quickly came out and said, we're going to support The Voice and did that without surveying members, without a grassroots democratic process. It's probably the case that if they did have a big vote of all Greens members, the majority of members would have also said, yeah, support it. But there should have still been some democratic process there rather than it just being the party room itself making that decision. And that was a really classic example of elected reps going off and doing something without necessarily checking in with the membership. And in fact, the previous year, the Greens membership had had a long, probably more democratic process in partnership with the First Nations Greens Network that had decided on this sort of platform of uh, treaty first and truth telling and voice subsidiary to that. And that was kind of the broadly understood position among active members was like, okay, we've got this treaty, treaty before voice kind of general framing. And then the Greens MPs sort of unilaterally decided, actually, Labor's got voice on the table, we'll go for voice and argue for the others later. And there was just enough ambiguity in that agreed upon platform that they could sort of argue that, no, no, this still complies with what all the members have agreed to. But I think it was quite undemocratic. So I think, you know, reasonable people can disagree as to whether or not the voice is a good thing. Um, I'm hearing from a lot of First Nations activists on the ground that they don't support it and they don't want the referendum to go ahead and they'd rather focus on other stuff. And I take my lead from a lot of them. So I haven't personally decided how I'm going to vote in the referendum. I'm certainly at the moment refraining from commenting on it much because I think we need to make space for First Nations voices to lead that. Is there anything else that you want to say before we finish up? Just that I, I feel grateful that we have left media like you guys um, unpacking this stuff in more detail and thinking more deeply about this sort of thing. I think the Greens in Queensland are in a really good place and and... There's a noticeable difference now in the politics of the Queensland Greens compared to some of the Greens parties in other states. And I think it's, it's serving us well at the moment. And I'm really optimistic about with the coming Brisbane City Council election, I think we could win a whole bunch of seats. And I think a lot of activists and lefties around Australia haven't actually yet realised um, how important and valuable it would be for the Greens to win control of Brisbane City Council because it's such a big institution. And to put it bluntly, like Queensland's a bit of a political swing state, but the culture and values of Queensland are shaped here in the capital city and the culture and values of the capital city are shaped heavily by Brisbane City Council. So Brisbane is kind of this tail wagging the Queensland dog and Queensland is in turn the tail wagging the Australian political landscape. So like the coming council election is particularly important for activists to engage with and if we can win more green seats on a really radical anti-capitalist platform here in this city. I think the ramifications for the Queensland state election and subsequent federal politics will be huge. And so I hope pe more people start to pay attention to local government and particularly to Brisbane because this is a much bigger council. There's like a million voters in the Brisbane City Council area as compared to a couple of hundred thousand in some of the larger councils down south. So that's really important and exciting to me, but I also hope that more people will remind themselves that just having Greens elected isn't the end game and we shouldn't get complacent or think that, okay, now that we've got some Greens in Parliament, we don't have to do the other stuff. We need more organising on the street. We need more grassroots community projects bubbling up and supporting each other. We need to be active because we're facing a time of multiple overlapping crises and we've got to make that change. No one else is going to do it for us.
Fantastic. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much.